Thank you very much. My name is Warren Maddox. I am uh, Essential Skills Coordinator for Ty and Me. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. About, um, about 24 months ago, <coughs> Ty and Me became involved in a, a really interesting project based on the accommodation sector for the province of New Brunswick. And the project was called Upskill, which was sort of a name that was developed after the fact that we all got involved in it. Um, a lot of what we were doing and a lot of what Ty and B has been doing over the years goes into a number of areas in terms of training uh, people within the tourism sector. And, and some of the comments that Mario had made earlier just rang true with us, which is getting people to look at the tourism sector not as something that you do when you can't do anything else, but something that has a career and something that is worthwhile doing. Um, with this project, We've done a number of things, and it's a it's a very large project that, that is quite literally a pan-Canadian project that runs from Newfoundland and Labrador straight through British Columbia. Our major funder and uh, and uh, sort of overall driver of this project is the Office of, of Literacy and Essential Skills in Ottawa. Um, our major sort of logistics and data collection partner uh, is the Social Research and Demonstration Corporation out of Ottawa. Um, the Sector Council uh, partner within this is the Canadian Tourism Human Resource Council, and they're important in a way that I'll, I'll describe later on. And again, it goes back to something that Mario was saying, which is a, a commonality that exists between a lot of different industries. Um, of course, the Tourism Industry of, uh, Association of New Brunswick and other what we call HROs, which are other tourism industry associations across the province. Uh, with this project, we have Newfoundland and Labrador, New Brunswick, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan and British Columbia. Um, sort of behind the scenes and helping us develop curriculum, helping us develop uh, assessment tools, uh, Douglas College, and Skill Plan, and the Bow Valley College. Um, we have engaged over 100 hotels and are engaging somewhere between 1,700 and 1,800 employees across Canada in the study. The study itself is set on answering a relatively simple question, but what's proving to be a rather hellishly complex answer. And the question that was asked was, does essential skills training have a positive, negative, or neutral effect on return on investment? That's a straightforward one, and that's a question that doesn't matter if you're Mario or never. You're going into talking to a business owner, whether it's a hotel general manager, or whether it's someone that's one of the owners of the hotel, inevitably within five minutes of that conversation, the answer that you're going to have to face is, what's the value in this? What's the value in it for me? Why should I do this? What we're trying to do with the Upskill project is, in a very quantitative way, create a data set that we can come back at the end of the project and say, here it is have done this project, this is our methodology, these are the people that we've done in a random assignment on, we've done assessments, uh, both job-based as well as TAOS assessments, and this is where we've moved them. Um, at the end of that, we'll be able to answer it, and I hope, without trying to bias anything, I hope that the result will be, yes, there is a definite return on investment for business owners to do essential skills training certainly within the accommodation sector, and very little effort that can be easily moved to, uh, to uh, other sectors as well. We have two groups that are involved in the study, uh, a control group and a program group. All employees will get essential skills training, some sooner, program group, some a little later, which is the control group. Uh, the West Division from Pedal uh, provided uh, funding for us to come back and deliver the training with the control group. Part of the research project was to simply deliver the training to um, the program group and then the control group and get the curriculum to deal with on their own later. Um, we and Ty and B decided that that really wasn't good. It was leaving something untied at the end which we don't like. Um, and it allows us to just sort of build on the project and, and develop further on down the lines. The curriculum that we developed for this project specifically looked at four occupation groups within the hotel sector front desk agents, servers, line cooks, and housekeepers. 
essential skills are embedded within each of those curricula. So what we do is we have to make something that, that is relevant to them. And again, you know, as, as Mario was saying, which is you know, coming in and talking about literacy issues or coming in and talking about you know, any of those sorts of things gets people in a defensive position straight off if you don't want. So what we're doing is we're coming in and delivering curriculum job specific training to those four different occupation groups. This is where the CTHRC have, have, have especially come into play. We've gone through and with, uh, with the CTHRC, there's 47 different occupations within the accommodation sector that we're able to go in and, and, and have developed national occupation standards. It's a really solid baseline as to what that person's job should be. It's not brand specific. Um, that's a different issue. Every hotel has a different way of folding a sheet or laying a towel out or how they do the clean room cleaning, any of those sorts of things is all brand specific. That's higher up in the triangle. That's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned more about the first two bases within that triangle. And those are the essential skills training which will be embedded within job specific occupations. Um, so we'll have a very specific program for housekeeping room attendants, what we call HRAs. It's delivered on the national occupation standards and then we embed within that essential skills training. discovered some really interesting things, um, both on a pan-Canadian basis and as well as within New Brunswick. Um, obviously, and, and what brings everybody here today, which I don't think is a particular surprise to anybody, is that there are some fundamental essential skills gaps within the accommodation sector. I think that probably will transfer to just about anybody, uh, given some of the numbers that, uh, that were shown earlier. One of the things that really sort of surprised us and continues to surprise us um, is that numeracy, certainly on the East Coast, numeracy is even high. Um, there are less issues with numeracy than there are with um, uh, document use and understanding, uh, which are coming back a little bit. Um, and that's concerning to us in a number of ways. Um, numeracy is great and we're happy to be where it is. Document use and understanding is concerning because I challenge anybody to get through a day without running into at least 10 different documents that you have to interact with. And it doesn't, you know, prerequisite that is you've got to get out of bed. Um, otherwise, you're going to run into it. And whether they're electronic, whether they're paper, whatever the case may be, you are going to interact with documents. Um, in the, the sector that we're looking at, which is the, the accommodation sector, documents become unbelievably important. If you're in the front desk, it's all documented. If you're in housekeeping, Again, it's heavily based on it's not just a matter of, of going in and cleaning the room and moving on. There are documents that are attached to it, whether it's the warning label on the bottle, whether it's uh, um, room manifest, whether it's maintenance logs, all those sort of things that you go to interact with. Um, one of the other surprises that we found that I wasn't expecting, which is that essential skills gaps are present in those from, we have people that left school at grade seven, obviously have some essential skills issues and some other issues that they need to deal with and, and we've worked on as well. Um, those are more self-esteem and, and those sorts of issues. But we're finding essential skills gaps in people where we shouldn't be finding them, and that's university and college graduates. Um, but we're getting numbers back and, and assessments back um, from that group of people that are showing specifically, again, the fact of document use and understanding that it's not there, uh, that it's, you know, that we're getting mid twos where it should really be mid threes and mid fours. Um, so it's it's something that, that we really have to pay attention to. Um, English as a second or third language presents some challenges to employees and essential skills level, but it's not as great as we, as we had first thought, um, certainly on the East Coast. Um, it's a much different story when you get into Saskatchewan and British Columbia where essential skills level and English as a second language is, is definitely an issue. Um, actually in, in Saskatchewan and British Columbia it's not English as a second language, it's English as a third, maybe fourth, sometimes fifth language. Um, so there, when you get that kind of thing, the adaptation becomes a little uh, more tricky. Uh, one of the other things that we discover, managers are seriously overestimating the essential skill levels of their employees. Um, and that leads to the next one, which is enabling is art form for some of them. Uh, essential, essential skills awareness is not really all that high at this point. Um, I 
spend a significant amount of time really talking about and explaining the difference between the different levels of training and how at the very core is the essential skills level and everything else, all the other training that you're doing, all the other money that you're investing in, the brand training and your orientation and, and technical training is dependent on that essential skills training. Um, a lot of the time you'll talk to HR or TMs and they go, no, we got all the training we need. And then you start talking to them a little further. Um, of course, your immediate response after doing this for a while is, you know, bullshit, you have all the training you need, you don't. Um, of course, you can say that. Um, but you're trying to impress upon them, and, and what we're doing with this program is we're combining sort of the first two bases of the triangle together. So we have the job, you know, the national occupation standards, and the job specific training embedded essential skills training, so it's giving us a double impact. That makes their brand, your orientation, and all the little brand specific to stuff that they're doing, that they're confusing with essential skills, all that much more effective. Um, recently, and you know, I'll talk a little bit more about this as I go on, as I a better time. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we're trying to sort of get going at and it's expanding the essential, uh, the essential skills project and working on upskills into a more provincial based uh, um, essential skills training for the accommodation of the tourism industry and the food and beverage sector. We're trying to get a pilot project going, so we're doing a lot of development on it. And one of the questions that came back, I didn't know from the hotel, it was a fairly large hotel that shouldn't have come up with a no. Um, so part of my past life as I was a fundraiser and, and one of the things you taught in fundraising is that no rarely ever means no. No means no but or no it's not the right time. No because of this. So one of the most important things you can do when you get a no is find out what kind of no you just got. What's the real no? What's the real reason? So we sat down with the, with the general manager and, and said you know, that he gave us the polite answer. It was nice and it means nothing. So what's the why aren't you engaging in this program? And the answer that came back was, I have to convince my owners what the value of this is, and I don't know how to do that, and I need you to help me do that. So I've spent considerable time doing some really incredibly important reading into different marketing and, and values and, and other things, and I've created a, a document that will basically say, this is what the value is, until we have the, the hard data results from this one, which I can back in and say, here it is, in hard form. But one of the values that we're looking at is, in business, especially in the, in the hotel and accommodation sector, you'll spend money on towels, you'll spend money on furniture, you'll spend money on paint, you'll spend money on dishes, you'll spend money on a new book for your brand, you'll spend money on all these things, and your expected payoff and your value back is that you didn't match the competition, maybe put yourself slightly ahead of in terms of revenue. Why wouldn't you make that same kind of investment in your employees? And why would you expect any different setup for the value to be any different than you would in terms of fiscal plan investments? So if you make an investment of, let's say, $100,000 in your fiscal plan, as soon as you've made that and Mario's guys have walked out the door, back then the accounting principle of depreciation kicks in. So you're basing that one, let's say a hundred thousand or a million dollar investment, you're basing on that return over a two, three year period, more than depreciation, before you have to start looking at reviewing or renewing or doing what are next changes from that line. So why would it be any different with your employees? You make a $10,000 investment. Why does that investment have to pay off like that? It should you have to give it a certain amount of time to mature. So the value within making that investment is give it two or three years. So, okay, we've made an investment in a program. It's cost you $520 for each employee to take that program. Why would you expect that to generate back within three months? It's not fair. So let's give it a two year depreciation of payback time. That makes it $260 a year, an increased productivity, upselling or other benefits to your property that you have to make off those employees coming in. 260 bucks a year. 260 dollars a year. That's it. You will do it. You will make it back. I'm almost here to you. will make back the full 520 a year. That's the value of the statistical strength. That's the ability to increase your productivity, to have your front desk and your 
line folks and your servers all familiar with oral communication and upselling and selling techniques. It's the ability of your staff to have a full and complete comprehension of what safe and uh, health and safety issues are. It's the ability to reduce your turnover by 10%. Every time you lose an employee, the average cost, depending on the organization that you're in, the average cost will vary anywhere from $750 $10,000. Every employee you lose. I did a, a, an organizational needs assessment uh, with one hotel for many years and location was. Their turnover rate was 300%. So general manager and I were talking back and forth and we got the rate worked out, which was about 300%. And about five minutes before this, she was sort of complaining about how I don't have a marketing budget. So I let that float. I didn't say anything start talking about the retention of turnover. She had a turnover rate of 300%. Every employee that she was losing, replacing, coming back in, productivity losses, the time it takes for her, another employee to take your orientation, training, get them back into the mode again of, of being 100% or as you know, close to 100% as you can get, was costing her about $2,000. So she's doing it 300%. She's losing two grand with every employee turnover she's doing. Look at her and said, There's your marketing budget. They tackled it, they looked at it, they realized what they were getting caught in, and they spent a lot of time working on their HR issues. They reduced their turnover rate 300% to 60%. So now the marketing budget. That's the about it. So, where are we? Well, within this project, the upskills project. The organizational needs analysis is done on nine hotels in the province. That's the size of our, our study for this one. We have one, ex one exemplar, which is uh, uh, the Rod Bear machine. Um, they were selected for a number of reasons. Uh, one, they were the right size that we were looking for. Two, they had an unbelievable commitment to training and had an unbelievable interest in terms of what we're doing, and they had a really solid relationship with Tony B. So they are our guinea pig. Employee engagements have been completed on seven hotels with one to go. Uh, baseline employee survey has been done on 100 employees at seven hotels with one hotel and 20 more to go. Uh, CAS assessment have done, have been done on 100 employees. Occupation based assessments have been done at three hotels. So we come into a hotel, this is how the process works. We come into a hotel. start by customering the general manager and the HR director. Um, then we come back in and we do an employee engagement session. And that's me coming in and doing about a 15 minute sales pitch to the employees to get them to volunteer. If they don't volunteer, they're not in. You've got to volunteer, this is going to be your, your deal. We then do a, a baseline survey, just as a data collection, SRDC needs it, we need it to, to be able to get a, a good scope of what's going on. Gets ultimately get all this really terrific information in terms of, of what's out there for the, for the accommodation sector. Uh, we then do a TAVS assessment, uh, which gives us a really good idea of where document use and understanding and where our seeing literacy are at. But a month later, we come back in with our own IMB assessors and do job shadowing and assessments. And that looks, gives us the ability to look and see exactly how they're going uh, with their job compared to the national occupation standards. That's relevant because later on down the line, after they've gotten the training, after they've gone through this, whether it's control, how we do this, good. Two minutes, holy cow. Um, <laughs> after they've gone through that, um, we come back in at the very end and we do another assessment. A, that gives us an ability to see whether that movement has moved, whether we've created that value that's based, the entire study is based on. Also, it lets us come back and say, if you want to become a certified housekeeper, a certified front desk agent, a certified server, or a certified line cook, if you're already three quarters of the way there, all you have to do is write the test, and you're done. So we have uh, we have certification. Uh, training is underway at our uh, at our uh, exemplar and training start. Uh, what's next? More training. Um, develop a working base for a pilot project. Uh, we tried this uh, earlier in the year. We ran it. Some engagement channel challenges. Uh, again, me being me, I never take no for an answer. I don't want you to follow it up with a punch, and I generally take no as an answer. Um, so we're back at the pilot project again, making some adjustments and continuing to, uh, to fester at will. Um, and hopefully 
down the line, what we'd like to do is to take this project, once we have a pilot project for it, um, develop it into a slightly bigger project on a bilingual basis, cover the problems with it, come back, reintroduce it again for the food and beverage sector. Ah, it to the end. And uh, I haven't moved left about. Um, so that's really the, the upskill project in a nutshell. Uh, interesting results coming in. It's been a blast to get out and meet people. Um, it's been a blast to get out and introduce the whole concept of essential skills to some of the most skeptical people on the planet Earth. Um, these are people that, again, like Mario was saying, that you know, school didn't work for them. And if you're coming in and you're talking about school and training, you know, the, the most important thing is breaking it away from training is not school. What we're going to come in and do is empower you. And what we're going to come in and do is, as an old saying that we used to use in, a, in another profession that I was in, we're not there to fill up a bucket. Rather, we're there to light a fire. Thank you.